Thank you. I'm Kevin Butterfield, the director of the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. Uh, the Kluge Center is one of the sponsors of this year's festival. We're proud to help bring America's most beloved writers here. The Kluge Center works to bring scholars into residence to work in the collections of the world's largest library and to do work of the sort that you'll be hearing about today. Welcome to everyone who is joining us live on C-SPAN as well. We're proud to partner with C-SPAN again this year. This panel, History is Heating Up, Environmental Awakening versus Climate Change Denial, features Douglas Brinkley, David Lipsky, and Jen White. Seven of Douglas's books have been New York Times bestsellers. Six have been chosen as New York Times Notable Books of the Year. His most recent is Silent Spring Revolution. David is the author of two New York Times bestsellers and an artist in residence at NYU. Our moderator, Jen White, is host of the daily two-hour program 1A from WAMU and National Public Radio. Please join me in welcoming them. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for coming out for this conversation. As you're listening, I hope you will form your own questions because we'll have some time at the end of the panel and you can just step up to the mic. I'll let you know when to start that process and you can ask questions of our authors as well. It's always exciting to speak to people as accomplished as David and Douglas, but it gets even more exciting when you get on a phone call with them to plan this conversation and you realize they're such big fans of one another's work. They were absolutely delighted to speak to one another. Um, so I wanna just start this conversation by having you each give us a brief overview of your work for people who haven't read the books yet. Douglas? Uh, well, my book is Silent Spring Revolution and it's John F. Kennedy, Rachel Carson, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, and the Great Environmental Awakening. And I had previously written a book on Theodore Roosevelt in conservation called The Wilderness Warrior. And that's how TR saved 234 million acres of wild America, of public lands, through national monuments and national parks and federal bird reservations and created the National Forest uh, Service, on and on. I consider that the first wave of environmentalism. Second wave, I wrote a book called Rightful Heritage about FDR's era and how FDR was a tree planter. In fact, whenever he would fill out a form for occupation, uh, Roosevelt would write tree farmer, like that's my <laughs> job. He was a scientific farmer on the Hudson River. Eleanor Roosevelt said he knows every flower, nook, cranny of the Hudson River of Dutchess County. And I can rattle off national parks FDR created, many, like he created Big Bend on D-Day. Hmm. He didn't cancel the meetings. He was de de designing um, how roads and how to visit Big Bend Park in Texas while the, the Normandy invasion was going on. That's how deep he was in all this. But he also created 800 state parks. And they create, planted the Civilian Conservation Corps three billion trees. Uh, the first two waves. The third wave is this book, and it really um, is about three presidents, none Roosevelt, no Roosevelts. But um, in a, it really, I had to begin it in 1945 after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, birth of the atomic age. We started blowing up nuclear weapons willy-nilly in Nevada. We detonated 1,054 nuclear weapons in America between 1946 and 1991. So there became this big anti-nuclear testing movement, uh, which Rachel Carson was part of, and uh, many others, Coretta Scott King, Norman Cousins, Dr. Albert Schweitzer on a global way. But was, what was exciting is John F. Kennedy had the vision and temerity to sign the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And due to Kennedy's astute diplomacy, an ecological act of great importance occurred. We stopped testing nuclear weapons. Mm. He made a deal with uh, Khrushchev and the Soviet Union and Britain. So today we can't test those weapons. Um, and in my book, I ended, you know, I deal with Kennedy who loved Cape Cod, created Cape Cod National Seashore, Point Reyes out in Marin County, beautiful California, Padre Island, Texas. He was trying to save shorelines before he was killed. Uh, I deal with things like the, uh, the first big uh, uh, Clean Air Act of 1963 and the follow-up one in 1970. 
Um, Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson were, had a rancher's view of conservation, but as you know, Lady Bird, her whole life was about beautification and anti-billboards and really helped save places like Redwood National Park and create the wild and scenic trail system and uh, our national river system. Much more I tell you about the Johnsons are in the book. And then Nixon, the unlikely environmentalist. <laughs> um, Nixon, you know, I always say, what's your Walden Pond? Like what place you in the audience, nature speaks most to you? You know, Kennedy was the sea, Cape Cod, Hyannis, the Atlantic seaboard, Johnson, the Pedernales River and the beautiful hill country of Texas. Nixon did not have one. <laughs> it wasn't his thing, the environment, yeah. but you guys, the public demanded clean air, demanded clean water to the point that Nixon uh, was really forced and to his credit did it, created the National Environmental Policy Act and NEPA, which gives us environmental impact statements, did the Clean Air Act in 72, he didn't want to, but he got it done, mainly created the Environmental Protection Agency in 1970 and put a really great man, William Ruckelshaus, in charge of it, who went after busting polluters. And I'll, I'll end my little talk there and just say, you guys, are, we're all meeting here at the National Book Festival. It is 50 years ago that the Endangered Species Act passed where we have saved the bald eagle, where we've saved manatee, where we've, we've forever protected California condor and whooping cranes and sandhill cranes and alligator, and uh, you know, uh, it came back with, with, a, with vengeance. Mm -hmm. um, 50 years ago, we were really successful, but do you realize with that passed in 1973, what the, the vote was in the U.S. Senate? 92 to nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how bipartisan uh, that was because the public, after Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, came out, after people like Walt Disney were showing uh, how to protect wildlife on their movies, uh, and how the, this um, Ralph Nader and others were talking about consumer advocacy, and you had a group of environmental senators, mainly the one I admire most from my book is Frank Church of Idaho, who was the original thinker of wilderness and Lyndon Johnson signed the Wilderness Act in 64, and thank God he did, because now we have millions of acres of protected land that roads won't penetrate to at least give species a place that they could uh, replenish and survive with all of this, uh, this helter-skelter of the industrial law that we're, we're, we seem to be hell-bent on um, propagating in North America and destroying our scenic places. Well, th well David, I, your book is a little different. Hmm. Um, and explain first the title. Um, so the title is The Parrot and the Igloo. Um, but before I do, Jen, I just, two things. A, when you mention endangered species at a celebration of books, it makes me anxious as a reader. Since, <laughs> um, and the second thing, just from, from one of the things that Doug was saying is, should FDR have been focusing on a national park on D-Day? Yes. <laughs> I, mean, that, I don't know if I was the only person I will who tell had you like, why. Yeah, please go ahead. Do you want me to? Yeah. Um, it, because they were trying not to deflect. He was a bird watcher and FDR went to Charlottesville and they didn't want to be worried about D-Day. They didn't want to give the media a clue. Mm -hmm. So when he was out bird watching in Charlottesville with some military friends of his, it was like, oh, Roosevelt's not doing much. So when he came in, he kept whatever his day's uh, you know, agenda was. If you canceled it, the media would think something big's happening. So he happened to have booked that day a long time meeting with Eamon Carter, who if you go to Fort Worth, it's the Eamon Carter Museum. He's one of the great art collectors, rich guy down there, who had been crusading in Texas to save Big Ben Park. And uh, Roosevelt wanted it to be both a, a park that was between Mexico and the United States with the Rio Grande in the middle, creating one big biosphere, really, down along the border. So he simply was going through with his meetings to not give anybody an idea that there was something going on. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> so back to the parrot in the igloo, David. Yeah, uh, but um, Nixon also, there's a beautiful uh, bridge between the two books because uh, my book really starts right after Nixon comes in. So when we were talking on the phone, it seemed like you could think of our books as Godfather One and Godfather Two. <laughs> um, and Nixon is a fascinating person, and I love what Doug was saying about what the Environmental Protection Act shows about 
our action as voters and as people who take polls. Nixon did not care about the environment at all. Um, the famous thing is that when he went to the beach, he would wear dress shoes. Uh, he, would, he would think that I was showing too much skin if I was on the beach, <laughs> basically. Um, but he was forced to because everyone in the country really wanted their environment cleaned up. Uh, what he was saying, the, the year that he signed in the EPA, the New York Times said, it's one of the really bright moments in an otherwise dismal year. And that same year, President Nixon was telling two executives from Ford Motor Company, the environmentalists, what they really want to do is go back and live like a bunch of damn dirty animals. Uh, what they're really interested in is destroying the system. But since we wanted clean air and clean water and clean skies so much, he had to sign in. That's President Nixon's ghost calling in to say. <laughs> <laughs> it was Chrysler, it wasn't Ford Motor Company. Um, but because we demanded it, he actually is known to have approved more significant environmental legislation than any president in history. Um, my book is about ironies like that, the parrot and the igloo. And the quickest way to describe it is just to say what the title is. Um, in 1956, uh, American climate scientists began speaking with American reporters. And they said, we've been tracking this issue about carbon dioxide. And there's a really good chance that it will begin to heat our atmosphere. Uh, Roger Revelle, who's one of the first really prominent American climate scientists, he gave it a year. He said, in about 50 years from 1956, uh, it, it could have a violent effect on the Earth's climate. Uh, this, was, this sort of thing was covered by the Times, and the Times that October, Ravel had said that in May, so they were working different seasons. Um, the Times said, you know, in the far future, if carbon dioxide warming takes effect, uh, the polar regions will be changed to tropical jungles where tigers will roam through the underbrush and gaudy parrots will squawk from the trees. So we had an astonishing head start, which is one of the things, the stories I wanted to tell. Um, in 2010, after the work of tremendously effective mood musicians, the people who decide what tune they want your opinions to play, and then find a way to make you hear that in your head, so what you say harmonizes with the effects that they want. Uh, in 2010, one of the great denial senators, uh, Senator James Mountain Inhofe of Oklahoma, he built uh, an igloo on the mall here in DC because there'd been a heavy snowfall. And he put a sign on top that said, Al Gore's new home. And then honk if you love global warming. And so the story my book tells is how we went from that parrot to that igloo. One of the things I'm always curious about when we, when we look at history is what, what lessons we can take, especially lessons that it doesn't seem we seem we've quite learned yet. And, and David, just give us a brief example of a lesson we should take away from prior environmental movements. <laughs> um, listen to scientists. Um, I also, <laughs> um, I'll just, there were, um, in 1977, the most famous warning that came in the 70s, and it's because of the warnings that I began reading about when I was deciding to write this book, uh, the most famous warning from the 70s is from 1979, but two years earlier, um, the National Academy of Sciences did the first big report on climate change, and it was 270 pages, so about half the length of this. Um, and what they said is, we have to start acting now. We can't wait until we are sure, because uh, it takes a whole generation to change energy sources. And if we don't act now, um, for, all for all practical purposes, the die will be cast. So mm -hmm. listen to scientists. scientists. Douglas, what about for you? Well, and you know, in, in, to your point, David, in 1960, Time Magazine chose scientists as their person of the year. <laughs> Meaning, in, in Kennedy had a in a first year in White House like a seventy plus approval rating, and so there was this notion that we did listen to the experts. So, for example, when Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring in 1962, warning about DDT and pesticides being detrimental to your health, 
having a carcinogenic effect on animals and, and, and potentially humans. Um, Kennedy was asked at a press conference, what about Rachel Carson's you know, articles in The New Yorker? And he said, well, I'm going to put in a scientific panel, an advisory panel, we're going to look into her research, and if it holds up, and he found the best scientist, you can, they came up with a in pretty quick fashion, a report that proved that Carson's research was accurate. And yet it took a decade to ban DDT. It was not until 1972, Rachel Carson dies of breast cancer in 64, and Kennedy, of course, is dead in 63. But there became this movement, that's why I call it Silent Spring Revolution. Um, and the big turning point in my mind was the birth of environmental law in the 60s. Even as late as 1965 and 66, it was called conservation. Hmm. Lyndon Johnson's program was the new conservation. But environment started kicking in due to Barry Commoner, um, and, and scientists were using the term environment, and it really kind of uh, took hold, and DDT got banned by Nixon and Ruckel's house um, in 72. Um, and, uh, and the big lesson of all of this is uh, it's the people. We have to speak up. We can't, on, on the cursing of climate chaos today, these reports are all there. I mean, I deal with them in my book, like, uh, like David, I mean, in, the, with um, Ravel in the 50s talking about, and Kennedy administration had a loose document going around about what were climate uh, uh, change. Johnson in 65 tried to give a speech about it as early as 65. But you know, he had Medicaid and Medicare and Vietnam and Civil Rights Acts, voting rights, just kind of got buried in the media flow. I print almost verbatim in the book a memo that, I don't, any of you remember uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan? Mm -hmm. New York, you know, center brilliant guy. Moynihan writes um, John Ehrlichman of Nixon's domestic advisor for Nixon that he's done investigation and said that if this client, the scientists are saying we are in big trouble due to CO2 emissions, in the letter it says, what does this mean? It means goodbye Miami and New York City forever, verdict on Seattle unknown. <laughs> Well, truly, I mean, there it is in the White House, and and then you'll find other presidents, you know, Jimmy Carter trying to do, you know, put solar panels on the White House and and get up global reports for 2000. But the truth is, there we failed. We're sitting here today. There is no climate hero president, um, and for the reasons that David marks in his book, the 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 oil and gas petroleum industry started organizing starting in 1973 with the Arab oil embargo and gas prices went up and they had their own groups to start attacking environmentalists and they, it took, they even said in the famous Powell memo, it'll take about 30 years to undo all the wins <laughs> of the environmentalists of the 60s and the early 70s. What they don't like the companies was federal regulation. If you're a mining company, you don't want to be regulated. You don't want the, the federal government. And this, this movement in the 60s, as David Brower, head of the Sierra Club, said, not only did they win, they had fun. They stopped a dam in the Grand Canyon, a dam in Dinosaur National Monument, dams that were stopped through protest hikes. William O. Douglas, Supreme Court Justice, hiked 186 miles here in Washington to save the CNO Canal from D.C. to Cumberland, Maryland, and to stop a highway from coming in. Win after win after win after win in that period. But by 73, I and mean, certainly by 80, the Reagan revolution kicks in. And now if you're an environmentalist, you're seen as a Democrat. And if you're, uh, and, and, you know, and, and you're vilified by the Republicans, and the Republicans are seen as, as a captive of the oil and gas industry and these new foundations that were born uh, like Federalist Society and Cato Institute and uh, you know, Heritage Foundation, whose goal it was to undo Rachel Carsonism. D David, it, it makes me wonder in your research for your book, what you discovered about how the American public viewed the government's role in addressing hmm. global warming, whether our perception of the role the government should play changed? Um, it didn't, which I found really reassuring and heartening because it is a story that's pretty much all irony. I just wanted to say that I just always love talking to Doug. Um, 
how odd that the Republicans are seen that way. What a terrible mystery that they would be seen as working with uh, the fossil fuel industries to continue to help them continue to make profits. It just is very mystifying. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, what a, the game has been to make us change our minds, basically, just what Doug was saying. Once it was clear that we could, as a people, demand that uh, that we get environmental regulation so that even then Governor Reagan, who had such a ruinous effect when he was President Reagan, I hope I'm not offending anybody who likes that fine airport. Um, <laughs> but uh, in about 67, 68, he was saying when the movement was starting, seen one redwood, seen them all. So you should cut them for highways. But then by 69 and 70, the environment became what reporters then would call a motherhood issue. The idea being, who's against motherhood, right? And so then President, Governor Reagan was saying, we need an all-out war to stop the debauching of the American environment. Um, when people saw the effect that Americans could have when the fossil fuel industries and the people who work with them and also help to design their strategies, um, those human beings who resemble AI in saying, here's the best way to do it, um, they decided to kind of try to change us. Um, but the American people, their polling was always the same. In 1997, after uh, the foes of the first international uh, climate warming protocol, um, when they said, look, it's not fair, China isn't gonna have to kick in, India's, India's not gonna have to kick in, it's not global, it won't work, was their very catchy slogan. Uh, they polled Americans, and 65% of us said, we want to control our carbon dioxide no matter what other nations do. And in 2007, after uh, another 10 years of the fight, when the IPCC said, just like the scientists told you in 56 and 79, this is happening and we're the ones responsible, across the board, Republicans, Democrats, independents, they all wanted action to be taken on climate because everyone has to go outside, even if it's just to get in their car. So it's something that unites everybody. And the whole, the incredible holding action, an astonishing one, that was uh, done by the fossil fuel people and their hired scientists, was just to stand in the way of our opinion, basically. You know, sometimes disasters, environmental, natural disasters, wake people up, like as we're here, here this afternoon, our hearts go out to Hawaii, what's happening in Maui, and 80 dead, and just the largest natural disaster in history, and yet we, you can almost feel more of these coming. You can just feel it. Um, and in fact, the reason we have an EPA in, in 1970 was the Santa Barbara oil spill. Mm. And everybody, it was color TV, uh, like Walter Cronkite's news broadcast went color in 1967 for the first time. So in color, in your living rooms, you're seeing paradise, Santa Barbara, California, with tar balls and goo or a bird stuck in oil. And Nixon at first minimized it. First instinct was not that big a deal. <laughs> but he listened to Walter Hickel, his interior secretary, who went to the ground in Santa Barbara and immediately called the White House and told Nixon, don't minimize it. It's bad. Plus, we've only been in the office seven days. Blame it on Johnson. And, 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 you know. <laughs> but that summer, Nixon was very startled that when Neil Armstrong was walking on the moon, Time magazine was writing about the Cuyahoga River in Ohio on fire and the Rouge River on fire. And then Gaylord Nelson, a, a senator from Wisconsin who saved the Apostle Islands, 22 beautiful islands up in Wisconsin. He did so much more, Gaylord Nelson. But he came up with the idea of Earth Day. And Nixon started finding out this Earth Day, and he was suspicious of it because at every college campus, there suddenly was a little Earth Day office. And Nixon asked the obvious question, who's paying for this? Huh. How do these spring up like mushrooms on every college campus Earth Day? Where's the money coming from? And he got a big answer. You know who paid for that bill of Earth Day, April 22nd, 1970, the first? Walter Ruther, the United Automobile Workers. Hmm. Because there was a green labor alliance back then, and Ruther's view was, 
Working people may not be able to go to Yosemite or Yellowstone. They're going to be living in Flint, Michigan, or they're going to be living in Ypsilanti. And we need clean lakes, clean ponds, places to fish, picnic areas. And really, he was talking about what today we call environmental justice issues and how since certain, uh, in American history, we take our industrial debris, our waste, our toxins, our poisons, and dump them in neighborhoods of people of color. And, and, and you get cancers clusters, you get spikes. And so in the 60s, you start seeing the birth of an environmental justice movement with people like Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta out in the San Joaquin and Imperial Valleys protesting pesticides that are deforming um, Mexican-American children working the agricultural fields. Dr. King gets, you know, killed at the Memphis sanitation strike. And people don't realize because of nuclear fallout, Dr. King said, what good does it do to segregate a lunch counter? I mean, to integrate a lunch counter like Greensboro, North Carolina, if the milk we're drinking has stardium 90 in it. Uh, that the environment had to be grow and become as e seen as a civil rights issue. To Andy Young, I talked to for my book, and Andy said he looked at the Montgomery bus boycott as an environmental issue. The black diesel of the buses in the hot days in Alabama were coming in through the back. So nobody, the, that was where you don't want to sit because of the, the air. And so there's a linkage between it. And John Lewis, becomes one of the leaders of the environmental justice movement in the 60s, but particularly in the 80s, where he pushes the issue and forces President Bill Clinton, uh, who didn't nobly started addressing how do we do remediation, how do we do cleanups, how can we help not poison um, lower income people in the United States, whether they're Latino or Latinas, whether they're um, Native American, it's, you know, living around uranium mines, or, or whether they're uh, black Americans in urban centers where their local neighborhoods are, are becoming the dump zones. I'm, I'm a Detroit native and was still in Michigan during the Flint water crisis. Um, and so lived through and watched the results of that industrial dumping um, years, decades after the automotive industry had left, had left Flint, but the effect still remained. David, it makes me wonder, when we, when we look at the overarching history of environmental movements, have there been missed opportunities? Have there been people who were left behind where had, had different parties come together, we might have been able to maintain some of the momentum we saw earlier? Yeah, I just, um, I just had this lovely moment of thinking that I was sitting next to the national memory Mm. Just, just, <laughs> just hearing Doug speak is just. Um, but yeah, there were huge missed opportunities. Um, one funny one, which I sort of forgot when I was researching, was in '97 there was this incredible fight to try to get the first global treaty, uh, where Europe and uh, and all the Americas and Australia would all regulate their carbon dioxide. And it took so long to get people to that meeting. It had first been discussed at the Rio summit in 91 and 92. Um, and it was going to be the centerpiece for uh, President Clinton and Vice President Gore. Uh, it was going to be something that Gore was going to run on. And President Clinton, after uh, when Kyoto passed at the 11th hour, the delegates there were you know, sacking out on tables. It was right down to the last minute. And when it was forwarded for adoption, uh, these hardened diplomats were crying and applauding. And then it was coming back to America. And America tends to need to take the lead on those things, because at that point, we were the, we were the head emitters. We wore that sooty crown. Um, and so President Clinton was giving uh, interviews to the Times saying, it's going to take an incredible amount of presidential energy and presidential focus, but we can get this done. And then 17 days later, 18 days later, there was a story in Drudge Report about uh, an error that President Clinton had been making for a long amount of time uh, with Monica Lewinsky. And so what could have been, and that became a very different use of presidential attention and presidential energy. So they're keeping moments like that throughout the history of this debate, this problem. Um, in 1979, the thing we were talking about earlier, National Academy of Sciences was asked, 
give us your best second opinion. Will this happen? And it was for, they only needed five days. They were like the jury that brings back a quick verdict. And they said, uh, this will be comforting to scientists, but it will be disturbing to policymakers. Uh, if the carbon dioxide release continues, this panel finds no reason to believe climate changes will not occur and no reason to believe those changes will be negligible. When scientists went to brief lawmakers about this, uh, and this is how this city works, and I think it's also a weakness in a way that we have as people, uh, the lawmakers ask some of these scientists, when are these changes going to occur? And these scientists in 1979 said, mm, you know, give or take 40 years. And the policymakers said, well, get back to us in 39. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yes. It, it, it also makes me wonder, Douglas, what are the conditions under which presidents are more likely to include major environmental change in their agenda, or, or the conditions that <laughs> make them back off of that? Well, it's a great question, because I looked at it intensely. Uh, some of you probably remember the great naturalist E.O. Wilson. Hmm. If, uh, if, if you haven't, look, look him up. Brilliant. Harvard, got, you know, especially it was ants in, in, in a way. But uh, he talked about biophilic people, people that love nature, love, love the natural world, some people that need to have a cat or a dog around them or wildlife around them or they're not fully complete. And he, he said others just don't care about that issue. So when you look at presidents, I mean, we've had only one, or, or, or Theodore Roosevelt, who has said that we're going to put natural resource management, protection of, of America the beautiful as the top national priority. And that's how he got so much done, because he, he prioritized it. Presidents often only get one or two things that they can really be big on. He, thank goodness, did that. And then FDR elevated it quite a bit. Nobody since those two has taken, uh, has the, the love of the natural world and wanting to know everything about it quite like them. Um, and so Barack Obama, a president that um, you know, did the uh, Affordable Care Act, once he, he, he got that done, a big, big thing, historic, significant, there was no gas left in the tank for, for climate. As, your book points out Rahm Emanuel saying, you know, no, we're not, you know, we're, we're dealing with voters, not dolphins, or something <laughs> to that effect, right? Yeah. What, um, what Rahm said was, uh, I think the dolphins will be okay for another year. <laughs> it's just, you know, how do you prioritize? I think most sane people would like to see the beautiful land stewardship, water stewardship, and, um, but, the politicization right now is frightening. Well, what about the economy? Because we're talking so much about inflation and interest rates. How does that fit into a presidential agenda? Um, it's a sad thing, but we can all feel it in our own lives, right? One of the, one of the saws, uh, one of the aphorisms that people in the environmental movement have is that no important uh, environmental legislation has ever been passed during bad economic times. It's just like in the same way if you have a downturn you know, at the kitchen table, you will get rid of Netflix or you'll get Hulu with the ads, right? Um, <laughs> one, of, one of the things that we do is, you know what, we can, you know, the dolphins will be okay for another year. It's just we can make fun of the government for making that choice, but that's the choice that we make, we tend to make too. And uh, one of the snake bit things about this issue is in 1977 and 79, when the science really did mature, um, that was during a terrible energy crisis. And so we chose ways to get more oil and more coal at a time when the Earth was asking for less oil and especially less coal. Yeah, and you know, Rachel Carson, who's a big figure in my book, I don't know if you realize, she worked for U.S. Fish and Wildlife. She wrote three extraordinary books about the sea. If you haven't read Rachel Carson on the oceans, mm. you must. Her home is here in Silver Spring, Maryland. They're turning it into a park. And she in Maine was her Walden. Uh, but she started getting information about DDT and pesticides. That got greenlit in World War II in the hurry up and win. And nobody ever regulated them. Um, but they were spraying, crop spraying these, these chemicals. For example, Jimmy Carter, who's on hospice right now, 
and you know, and his, his birthday will be this October 1, and he'll be 99. Uh, but everybody in his family died of pancreatic cancer. His mother, uh, Lillian, his father, his sister Gloria, his sister Ruth, his brother Billy, because he had left to go to the Navy Carter, but in that part of Sumner County where they had peanuts and cotton, they were spraying that, so it's a cluster belt of people that died of pancreatic cancer um, there. So Rachel Carson enters this battle because of a woman named Marjorie Spock. Does anybody remember Dr. Benjamin Spock, mm -hmm. the baby doctor? Mm -hmm. This is the baby doctor's sister, and she owned a big piece of land in Suffolk County, New York, Long Island, and the Suffolk County Mosquito Control and the USDA were just blanket spraying all the crops. Well, she was an organic farmer. So she was anti, early, big, ahead of her time with it, but was, I want organic produce. And she sues, and it goes all the way to Supreme Court, that my right to be an organic farmer is being taken away from me. She loses. But in her loss at the Supreme Court, William O. Douglas writes a dissent that gets published in Reader's Digest, and, and it begins Douglas starting to push Ann Carson that we need, well, Douglas would call it a wilderness bill of right, but that we all have a God-given right in the United States to clean breathing air and clean water. And that should be built into our, our, our system. And in the, for a while in the 60s, it looked like that could happen. Uh, but alas, that opportunity is missed, and uh, we now live in a country where there's pockets that are poisoned and other pockets that aren't, instead of it being a guaranteed fundamental birthright. In our earlier conversation, when we were planning this panel, I was surprised to hear from you, David, about polling data um, around where Americans are right now when it comes to global warming, um, the effect of mis and disinformation. And you shared that it's not that people don't believe global warming is real, but that there's another, another element at play in how we're processing the moment we're in right now. Explain that. Well, there was a great uh, editorial. Do you guys read Paul Krugman? Like, he just seemed obviously brilliant. Uh, uh, you guys need me to tell you that a Nobel-winning economist who writes for the Times <laughs> is worth reading. I, sh I should be off this panel. Um, <laughs> um, but well, he wrote a great thing last week, and he just said that, and we can all feel it, that climate change has joined the culture wars. So even people who know, they're like, okay, the other side cares about the climate. You know what? I hope it gets even hotter, you know, and I don't like snow anyway. So. In fact, one of the fascinating things about denialism is that it was never designed to win the argument. And the people who became the climate deniers were trained by tobacco to learn how to attack scientific studies. And it was the same with tobacco. They knew they would lose, but if they could delay the loss by 10 years, 20 years, they had 10 or 20 years more to make the money. Um, for, the, for a lot of the life of this issue, you did have people who would believe the denier arguments. That's all gone now. There's a, you can fool some of the people 16 times, 32 times, but when you get to 33 or 34, and we have a summer like the last couple, they're like, oh, I guess the scientists were right. And so now the question is, you know what? I still don't want to do anything. I remember when we were on the phone, one of the ways the deniers would take pre-existing ideas you have and then apply them to this issue is there's a, a fellow who, a guy named Patrick Michaels, who would complain to CNN, you don't put enough skeptics on the air. And so finally CNN got impatient and they checked, okay, who's the scientist we have most often on air talking about climate change? It was Patrick Michaels. And uh, Patrick Michaels, when he would go out to small events in places like small towns in Maine and try to get people to not want action on climate, he would say, forget all the science. What they really want to do is take money that you earned and give it to people who didn't earn it. And you know, uh, what is incredible about David's book and why you all have to read it, I, one fear I had as a historian, somebody who wants to document America, I was worried these climate denying bastards weren't going to pay for it in history. His book nails them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, 
and it's and there, there's no, when you read his book, there's no escaping a legacy of idiocy from some of these people. And, 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 and I mean it, and, and the charlatanism and, and lying and being um, corporate captive by people. It's, it's, it's a, a bunch of buffoons that, be, that gave birth to this climate denial movement. And I think David's right. It may have ended. The denial is you can't do, deny it anymore, but now, you know, there's just a saying, well, so what? What can we do? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, but the age of denial is, I think, over. But his book keeps it so people will realize that we used to have such bad faith citizens and, and politicians uh, that were willing to go that uh, um, build the igloo route. Mm -hmm. so, so what do we do about so what about it ism? Uh, because this is something we run into a lot on our show when we do programs about environmental policy, people say, there's nothing I can do individually to, to make a difference. It's, there has to be policy change. It's up to the corporations to change their practices. And I just want to pause for a moment and say, if you have questions for our panel, we've got about 15 minutes left. So please make your way to the microphones, and we'll get through as many questions as we can. But what do we do about that? Uh, <clears throat> I don't want to say anything else because it can just lower you, it'll lower me in your estimation because anything I say will make me seem less smart than Doug <laughs> did me the kindness of making me seem. Um, I really respect a climate scientist named Catherine Hayhoe and uh, she is speaking to this because the question is what do we do? So I thought that I would just read her prescription. She said when it comes to climate action, individual choices matter but systemic change is key. That's why the most effective thing we can do is to advocate for action where we work, study, live, and invest. By using our voice, we can truly make change contagious. Because one of the, um, do I have time for a story? Yes, you've got time for okay, a story. Okay, so do you guys remember uh, the Keep America Beautiful ad with the, um, with the, the First Peoples? Uh, he's walking in buckskin beside a highway and People are throwing their fast food out the window. Maybe they didn't get the right order in the drive-thru, but, but people are just tossing garbage out the window and it falls at this Indian, it was the name that they used for him in the, in the 70s. And he looks down and then the camera pulls in close and one tear slides down. Um, that's referred to as the most famous tear ever shed. Apparently this tier, that people have done studies, it's been um, most famous tier visibly shed. It's been seen something like five or six billion times that tier. And it made a generation of, my generation, it made us very conscious of the environment and conscious about things like litter. Um, the actual thing that it was for, it was being paid for, Keep America Beautiful, I see this, this gentleman is nodding, it was, Keep America Beautiful was funded by the beverage and packing industry. It was, it was by the people uh, who make the bottles for Pepsi and the cans for Coke and then the cans for Coors. And they were very anxious in the early 70s about recycling bills, which would cost them money. And so the slogan of that ad, which seemed very thrilling to us, people start pollution, people can stop it. What it really, what the corporation there, what those corporations are saying is, you have to do it, we're not gonna do anything. And so whenever the corporations suggest that we should take independent action, it's a way of them dodging their financial obligation. And it's also a way for... And, and, the, and the Native American actor was Sicilian. <laughs> He's from Sicily. Yeah. He was just a hired actor on the lot for Louisiana yeah. Sicilian <laughs> heritage with... Uh, well, I want to make sure we get to as many questions as possible, so we'll just ping pong back and forth, starting here. Thank you so much, um, uh, and amazing conversation. You're both brilliant, and I'm really looking forward to reading your work. Um, my quick question is, what are your thoughts on the Montana youth that tried to sue over climate change, and do you think that approach is a worthwhile one? Um, can I take that one? Um, there's a, it's a great question. Um, Professor James Hansen, who I think is a great, great hero, and it was an honor to tell his story, he thinks that's one of the great ways. He, after, um, after the, when Democrats came back into power and until President Biden, they didn't make lasting change, he began to think that the only way to actually be effective on this issue was through the courts. So yes, absolutely. 
Next question. Hello. Um, so you guys talked about the economy and climate being seen as like these separate issues for a lot of politicians, like especially with the Obama example. Um, and this idea that like the dolphins can wait, but first we need to, you know, help people with healthcare, and um, have also talked about this focus on like um, conservation and saving nature. And now I feel like in a lot of climate movements, there's sort of this shift to like focus on people's lives and how we're all in peril because of this, and especially with like climate change joining the culture wars. So I guess I was wondering. Um, do you think that going forward there will be a shift for politicians and for getting policy done in shifting towards talking about like economic issues also as climate issues and like you know the healthcare cost that comes with climate issues or the cost of rebuking a city after a natural disaster? Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's a path forward where it's not seen as just like this liberal you know save the trees thing, but where like it's intertwined with economic equality? What a great question. Really stunning question, the best question mm. you could have asked. Of course, um, we, the, in, the, in the sense that a lot of our solutions are gonna come through, the, uh, through innovation, finding new technologies, uh, how to, you know, I was just in, up in Rhode Island with the biggest offshore wind farm and what are we doing with solar and new experiments with uh, hydrogen fuel cells and, it's a very robust way, and we're going to have to be, as, as environmentalists, climate activists, arguing the, the, the money imperative that we cannot not keep going the route we're going. We're going to have to be re rebuilding city after city after city, burning, dislocation, global cost. And so it's always good to, to make that leap uh, and connect it. I think that's the hope. So California, for example, by just picking on that state, or, or say Washington's with them right now, but um, they're 20, 30, you're not gonna be able to get fossil fuel uh, fill up in California. Now what does that mean? You're not gonna be able to get your get going fill up? It means that Ford and GM are starting to really amp up how can we, that's a big market, California. It's something one of like the sixth largest economy in the world, Ford doesn't care if they, they just as soon sell electric car or another kind of car, then they're not wedded to the gasoline world. Um, so I find hopeful things going on, and I think the key is going to be to keep the, the reminding people of the economics of, of uh, that green business is smart business, it's the future, it's American leadership. And also the only thing I'll say very quickly, I tell young people, don't get depressed. Mm. Pretty hard. Don't go. Don't become a climate activist. We don't need moody, sour, dark people. <laughs> talk. Talk about how we can save the planet. Be positive. Join groups. Have fun saving Earth, and join a small group. If you don't have the time to get into some, you know, some of your majoring environmental science or environmental engineering, great but others can just join a group that's trying to save a local uh, wetlands or trying to help a particular species survive or try, trying to um, you know, get a better uh, air quality standard in their state. Uh, there's so much to do, but I think if you join something and get engaged, we're gonna grow. Hmm. There are gonna be so many citizens that, and, and, when, and there'll be a moment for what I'm calling the fourth wave. Hmm. It will kick in because the one thing we've done well, us baby boomers, we, we deserve to be criticized for a lot, <laughs> but we did get the terms ecology and environmental science, environmental law going. I don't know a university now that's not prioritizing the environment and hirings and, and looking at buildings, green building standards. We're getting there. It's just our attention span um, as Americans, we like things quickly mm. and particularly with our iPhone and instant information. And we're now in, to get out of this industrial revolution and move to the green, re it's, it's a taking time. Mm. And so you gotta be in for the long haul and just love the earth and the planet so much and fight for it in, in, in really uh, exciting ways, be excited about it. No depression, no, no, no psychological <laughs> meltdowns. Um, be, I, I know it gets horrible to watch the, I'm, I get ill watching Hawaii right now. Mm -hmm. 
I really, I do. And, but I don't want to start being a teacher saying, oh, we're doomed, we screwed it up, the planet's disappearing, the book of Revelations is true. <laughs> uh, I, what, what good's that going to do? Mm. Let's get through a couple more questions. Go ahead. How brilliant this question is, but um, I'm struck by your passion, and I'm curious at what age and how did you get interested in the environment? I uh, thank you for that. Uh, my mother uh, and father, my dad just died a couple months ago, but my mom and dad were teachers, and I had the luxury of having a trailer. A, a, we had a coachman trailer, and we got to visit the national parks and state parks and go camping all around our beautiful country. Mm -hmm. So I fell in love with the badlands of North Dakota and the redwood forest of mm -hmm. California and the Tetons and, and you know, the um, Mojave Desert. And I just, so my whole life then became kind of American preservation, conservation, it's what I love. Mm -hmm. So I owe it to my mom and dad on those travels. And since we're at a book festival, I have one, uh, I, on my book, Silent Spring, then I did one of those things for the New York Times where they asked me, who would I like to go to dinner with? Which is a daunting question of <laughs> what writers would you most like to have a dinner with? And uh, I thought hard and my first choice was Henry David Thoreau. Mm -hmm. I just loved Walden as a kid growing up and Cape, his book Cape Cod in the Maine Woods. And then I added Rachel Carson, who I've learned to love her thinking so much and Charles Darwin, mm -hmm. uh, who was be, the, to show that good writing can ma be matched with science and exploration. David. Your background? What brought you to this? this I story? thought you were going to ask about the dinner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was already. Yeah. I want to know <laughs> now the dinner. <laughs> but, um, uh, the dinner. Um, I don't know. I I uh, I've lost relatives recently, so I would always go. The first thing I would do is just mm -hmm. be with some people who passed. My father passed during COVID, mm -hmm. so I'd probably have dinner with him. Um, but I would like to. I would like to sit down with Roger Revelle and say, "God, you were exactly right. <laughs> yeah. You said 50 years, and it was 50 years." But what got me into the environment? Um, I just couldn't believe we screwed up this way, and I wanted to tell the story. I also wanted it so that it, so nothing like this would happen again. Yeah. Just what Doug was saying, like we had an incredible head start, and we didn't act, and so that seemed like a story really worth telling because there are so many great things that we do as a people, but sometimes we don't, uh, we don't always pay the bills that we don't like paying on time. And so this was a great way to remind people that that's a good thing to do. We have time for one more question. Thank you both. Um, just one quick question. So you talk about, of course, the, the political battle between um, you know, Republicans and Democrats, but also there's the context of the urban-rural divide and the fact that a lot of rural communities do rely on uh, natural resource fossil fuel industries um, to keep their communities afloat and their economies going. So how do you think we can have these conversations that are productive um, that will lead to uh, fundamental lasting change uh, within the environment? I'd love to hear from both of you on that. And we've got just a couple minutes left, Douglas. Um, if I go to Toledo, Ohio, or uh, and talk to a audience of um, largely Trump supporters, and if I avoid using the word environment, huh. uh, and instead say, "Don't we all want Lake Erie clean?" It was, yeah. Don't we want to fish the Maumee River again? Yes. Don't we all want clean air? Yes. But I start seeing the word environment. They see you're a stalking horse for liberalism mm -hmm. or the Democratic Party. They might let you say it once, but you could feel their rigidness. And if you start saying climate change and environment, they're, they're out. Hmm. You, you're, you're the enemy team. They see you as the big Democrat on the side. And so some of it is the way we talk to each other. But, I, but um, the best, I, I'm sorry, I'm a, we're at a book festival as I keep thinking of wanting to mention writers, but read Wendell Berry if hmm. you have it yet. Wendell Berry and the agrarian vision and how his view was you go back to a small town, instead of all of the, the, the intellectuals in New York and Los Angeles, go back to where you're from in Ohio or Indiana or Minnesota and work in that community and build trust on environmental issues and, and show what sustainable farming's like or how to restore uh, burned out land the way Aldo Leopold did in a Sand County Almanac. And, uh, it's hard to do what Barry's suggesting, but it's really uh, uh, beautiful to read his thinking. He's one of my favorite writers alive today, Wendell Barry. David, briefly? Sure, and then um, just because uh, 
Uh, thanks, Jen. Um, just because uh, Doug was talking about writers, um, it was so well known by mid-century that you guys know like the Nabokov novel Lolita, which came out in 55 but was being written in the late 40s. When Nabokov needed a scientific expedition for Humbert Humbert to go on, he sends him to the Arctic to, to check out to research climate change. That is how long the science has been with us. And so writers are always kind of a great way to chart the progress of something. But we had, the three of us had a great conversation about environmental justice last week. So I would flip your question and look at it from the, from the point of view of people in the cities uh, talking to people in the country. Um, one of the things that made me really anxious is that the divide that we've seen already and that Doug wrote about really beautifully in Silent Pursuing Revolution, um, people with money will be able to, if we continue down this road of painfully heating landscapes, the people in the cities will be able to go to the country. Essentially, money will offer protection from the climate changes, from the immediate discomfort. And that is something that will be very bad, both for, the, for us as individual people and also for us as a people. Well, David Lipsky is the author of The Parrot in the Igloo. He will sign his book at table 13 at noon today. And Douglas Brinkley is the author of Silent Spring Revolution. You can have your book signed by Douglas at table 12 at noon. Douglas, David, it's been such a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.